Gather round, Altmer of Shimmerine, and listen close, for we are the descendants of the Divine. Look upon each other and see the purest pedigree of Aetherius. Shame upon the other elven races, for they neglected their sacred stock. They may turn blue and brown, grey and gold, but we High Elves remain unchanged. For long enough we have secured these blessed isles, and kept the slovenly hands of men from desecrating our glorious glass and cities. But alas, it seems that Tamriel proper requires our cleansing touch. Beasts and men are exceptional at waging war. They have drenched the mainland of Dawn's beauty in rivers of blood for as long as they've dwelt there. For many centuries, we have left them to their murderous natures. If they wished to paint the walls of their imperial city red with gore, that was their prerogative. But no amount of blood is enough for humanity. They'd see the whole realm in ruin if left unchecked. Do you recall the breaking of the dragon? This horrific middle dawn was the work of men. They hoped to exorcise the great and holy Auriel from Akatosh, like some malevolent spirit. They create a catastrophe, and who is left to fix it? We are. And now the men of the Heartland have blundered again, plunging the continent into a bloody interregnum. What is to be done about this? Do we mind our own business and await a new human tyrant to pick up the Imperial throne? Do we wait for a dozen zealous megalomaniacs to slaughter each other for the crown? Just so the victor can cast a desirous eye on our ancestral home? I think not. Nern is under threat, and as a result, our good queen had no choice but to form the Old Merry Dominion, with the primary ambition to conquer Cyrodiil. We will ensure, for the good of all who dwell in Nern, that men will never again tamper with forces beyond their comprehension and competence. Only the Old Merry, the High Elves and their noble allies, the Wood Elves and Catmen, have the wisdom and restraint to peaceably rule the disparate peoples of Tamriel. Though we are reluctant to take up this burden, events have shown that we must. Men always follow the destructive path of their defender and apologist, the missing god whom we shall not name. This ends here. Once again, elves shall rule Tamriel from the White Gold Tower, this time forever. The world has gone wrong, and we must put it right. March proudly beneath the eagle banner of the Old Merry Dominion. This stirring speech, with a little embellishment on my part, comes from the Dominion's Sapiarch of Indoctrination, a title that barely makes an attempt to disguise its inherent bias. While the Sapiarch spoke in an effort to indoctrinate as many young impressionable High Elves as possible, I won't be telling this story with quite so much partisanship. The rulers of Somerset would have you believe that Tamriel should be ruled by Elves. They not only believe their administration to be superior, but also insist that they are far better equipped to exercise justice and govern benevolently. This attitude is prevalent among most elven races who come into contact with humans, but today we're going to determine whether there is any truth to it. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Should elves rule Tamriel? Well, as is often the case, the best way to answer a loaded question about the Elder Scrolls lore is to go back to the very beginning. A popular theory for the creation of the races of Man and Mur comes from the annotated Anuad. The text describes a group of ancestor spirits called the Elnafei, who survived the cataclysmic battle between the primordial forces of Stasis and Change, Anu and Padamai. The duel was so destructive that the twelve worlds of creation were sundered one and all. Anu managed to salvage the remains of these shattered worlds, and they coalesced as Nern. With the exception of the Hist, the Elnafei were the only survivors of the great clash between light and darkness. Fate brought these divine refugees to Nern, along with a large fragment of their native homeworld. But not all of the Elnafei were fortunate enough to land on this fragment. They were scattered, and despite losing to his brother Anu, Padamai's force of change infused itself within the Lost Ones. The Elnafei who remained in their homeland, a realm that would someday come to be known as Tamriel, were the old Elnafei, the ancestors to elves. While the dispersed Elnafei were the ancestors to men, the wanderers. The old Elnafei fortified their borders from the chaos outside, hid their pocket of calm, and attempted to live on as before. All the while the wanderers wandered, finding each other amid the confused jumble of the broken worlds. It was only a matter of time before the wandering Elnafei converged on their lost native land, for it beckoned them with memories of home. 
This is the most ancient example of a Tamriel ruled solely by elves. And how did it pan out? Well, I'll let the Anuad speak for itself. Eventually, the wandering Elnafe found the hidden land of Old Elnafe and were amazed and joyful to find their kin living amid the splendour of ages past. The wandering Elnafe expected to be welcomed into the peaceful realm, but the Old Elnafe looked on them as degenerates, fallen from their former glory. For whatever reason, war broke out and raged across the whole of Nern. The old Elnafe retained their ancient power and knowledge, but the wanderers were more numerous and were toughened by their long struggle to survive on Nern. This war reshaped the face of Nern, sinking much of the land beneath new oceans and leaving the lands as we know them, Tamriel, Akavir, Admora and Yakuda. The old Elnafe realm, although ruined, became Tamriel. The remnants of the Wanderers were left divided on the other three continents. While it's hard to say how different the races of Man and Mer are from their Elnafe ancestors, it seems their treatment of one another is consistent throughout history, even in the Dawn times. The way Elves treat men in the Morefic era and beyond is strikingly reminiscent of how the old Elnafe looked upon their bygone kin in the Dawn era. So, the Morefic era came next, and Morefic derives from the Nordic tongue, meaning Era of the Elves. It is a fitting name because the descendants of the Old Ma, who were in turn descendants of the Old Elnafe, settled the bulk of Tamriel, when there was not a human in sight. The Dureni claimed the continent's northwest. The Farmer Snow Elves occupied the frozen north, though some actually debate their relation to the Old Ma. The Changed Ones, the Golden-Hued Kaima, settled the northeastern region of Resdane. The Bosma Wood Elves inhabited the forests of Valenwood in the southwest. The Aelids built their empire in the heartland of Sirid, and beneath the ground in Resdane and Skyrim, the Dwemer prospered. All the while, the Altmer, the closest relatives to the Oldmer, maintained a firm grasp over Somerset and their hallowed traditions. Nedic settlers would eventually arrive on Tamriel's northern shores and would settle all over the continent. And it is in these morefic times that we see exactly how the elves handle total power. Some Nedic migrations were strong-willed, others were more willing to embrace subservience, but in all cases, they were outmatched by elven civilizations that had had centuries to establish themselves as the preeminent powers in their respective regions. Working our way clockwise around Tamriel, let's take a look at how the elven powers ruled the races beneath them. The Snow Elves of Skyrim were perhaps the most amicable of the Myr, at least for a time. It is said in the Pocket Guide to the Empire that, for a time, relations between men and elves were harmonious, and the needs thrived in the new land, summoning more of their kin from the north to build the city of Sarfal. Judging by the fact that the settling humans were building great cities, it seems to me that the Snow Elves were content to coexist with the Northmen. Though there are passing comments in some texts that refer to the needs submitting to the authority of the Skyrim Elves. Either way, the humans lived with some degree of freedom, until they found an artifact of remarkable power deep beneath the city of Sarfal. It's speculated that the Falmer caught wind of this discovery, and sought to claim it by force. In a pivotal event called the Night of Tears, that would be immortalised in Nordic history, the Snow Elves attacked in the dead of night and slaughtered all the humans in the city. Perhaps they were afraid of what men could achieve with this artefact in their possession, or perhaps they simply coveted it for themselves. Only Isgrimor and his son survived the massacre, and we all know what came of his survival. This is the first of many early examples of elven misrule. Now let's head east. While some sources suggest Nedic migrations did travel east from Skyrim, there is scarce little evidence of them in Morrowind. The Kaima took some time to settle Resdane, and had a precarious relationship with the subterranean dwarves who were already abundant in the area. And when they did interact with humans, in the form of the Nordic Empire in the early First Era, it was the humans who were in a position of power. Though we'll talk more about the Nords soon. I could go on about Chimeri and Dunmeri history for an eternity, and there is a great deal of nuance to how this race managed power. They have great houses with vastly different approaches to governance and policy, and on top of this, they were unique in that they were ruled by a trio of demigods for much of their history. But there's no denying the fact that Dunmer rule is not ideal for anyone who's not a Dark Elf. Slave labour was a staple in Morrowind for much of history. Khajiit, 
Argonian, and even human trafficking were sanctioned, and a crucial facet of Morrowind's economy. In recent times, this practice has been outlawed, and I think it's important to note that the Imperials were the first to attempt to put a stop to it. But it took until the late Third Era to see slavery abolished. So I can say with confidence that Dark Elves do not make for benevolent and just rulers. And while we're in Morrowind, let's quickly look at the Dwemer. The genius of the Dwarves is undeniable, but they are also ruthless in their pursuit of knowledge and their desire to protect it from outsiders. Inherently, the Dwemer would not be fit to rule anyone but themselves, and you need only look at the transformation of the Snow Elves to see that. The Falmer refugees were forced to consume toxic fungi in exchange for asylum. The Snow Elves became the hunched, blinded Falmer, but at least the secrets of Dwemer science were guarded. We're going to go ahead and skip over the fetid swamps of Black Marsh, lest we all acquire a flesh-eating parasite and die before the end of the video. We could talk about Elsewhere's history of governance, but that would then raise the fundamental question of whether Khajiit are descendants of the elves at all, and I'd rather avoid that chasmic tangent. There's also not much to say about the Bosma of Valenwood, but I'll touch on it briefly. The Wood Elves have a unique relationship with Tamriel. They are committed to Ifray's Green Pact, and will therefore never bring harm to the natural flora of the land. With the exception of a few wars, the Bosma keep very much to themselves. For this reason, they've been described as cowards by some. In truth though, the Wood Elves simply enjoy living in harmony with the natural wonders of Valenwood. But this description does have a couple of rather blatant blemishes, the first being the only instance of Bosmeri conquest, carried out by the Cameron Usurper. Haman Cameron took the throne of Valenwood by force, and then tore across western Tamriel in a gruesome rampage. It is said he unleashed hordes of undead and summoned Daedra on his foes, and on civilians with equal barbarity. But he is but one Myr, and he most certainly did not have the full support of the Bosmeri people. Even before the rise of Haman Cameron, the Cameron dynasty was constantly embroiled in power struggles. King Eplir was an exemplary leader, but the Cameron name was used for centuries after to justify civil conflicts. When the Second Empire ended, the Camerons attempted to reinstate their authority over the other kingdoms, but culturally, each had drifted too far away to be united. Without any other greater power to rein in their ambitions, they began to war against one another, the Khajiit to the east, and the Colovians to the north. Valenwood ate away at itself, and offered no resistance to the coastal encroachments of the Malmer of Pyandania. The Green Pact for the most part pacifies the Wood Elves, but it also comes with a horrifying side effect. There is a magical trait innate to all Bosma known as the Wild Hunt. It can be instigated by a complex ritual, and it results in the Wood Elves transmogrifying into a horde of feral, supernatural beasts. These monsters stampede, changing their form constantly, slaying and devouring all in their path, and eventually, when left with no surviving targets, they turn upon themselves in a cannibalistic orgy. The Wild Hunt has been used for vengeance, as well as for dealing with political adversaries. A wild hunt was invoked to kill hiking Borgus of Skyrim when he aligned himself with the Elysian Order and travelled to Cyrodiil to encourage the declaration of war with Valenwood. And it was also used against the Khajiit after the Catfolk violated a truce during the Five Year War. Some say the hunt is used for justice, but also that every monster in the world that has ever been comes from a previous hunt. Those Bosma that go wild, they do not return. This preternatural power is a good argument for why the Bosma would not make good rulers. Borgus was a threat to the Wood Elves, but the Wild Hunt slaughtered him before any real danger emerged, and incited a 50-year war of succession. To unleash such a lethal natural force over rumour of war alone seems like a misuse of power, at least to me. The penultimate of the mainland groups to look at is the Dureni clan of High Rock. In the words of Vorian Dureni, few families in Tamriel can boast so many famous figures, wielding so much power over the fate of so many. Our warriors and kings are stuff of legend, and it is not to dismiss their honour and their achievements to say you have heard quite enough about them. Sounds like the perfect group of elves to justly rule a new frontier. The Dureni discovered a great tower made by the gods when the world was still congealing. From this tower the gods convened over matters of great import, and in the Morefic era, the Dureni clan claimed it as their capital. Compared to some elven powers, the Dureni were benevolent. 
for they didn't slaughter the newly arriving Nedic peoples, but they did subjugate them. The humans of Hyrok were little more than concubines to the Dureni, and their mongrel offspring would not be welcome among pure-blooded elves. Ironically, their exclusive elitist ways saw their power stretch too thin. Their power waned, and now the uncontaminated Dureni bloodline lives on in self-inflicted exile, confined to the shores of Isle Balfiera. Compared to the Dureni, the last mainland group was brutal beyond comprehension. The Aelids of Sirid built a glorious empire of white gold. Their architecture was so magnificent that it would endure for millennia after their race was swallowed by the passage of time. Aelid culture was refined and splendid, but like a gemstone, there were many flaws and imperfections that would tarnish their shining civilization. The Aelids saw the Nedic settlers as tools. They harvested young, able bodies from these human tribes and kept them in their grand citadels. Men were given over to the lifting of stones and the draining of the fields and the upkeep of temple and road. But that was not the full extent of the ruthless repression. Some Aelid kings venerated the Daedra, including the reprehensible harvester of souls Molag Bal. The slaves in these citadels became art tortures for strange pleasures, as in the Wailing Wheels of Vindazel and the Gut Gardens of Sersen. Others were made into flesh sculpture, which was everywhere among the slaves of the Aelids in those days. Or worse, the realms of the Fire King Hardhul, where the begetting of drugs drawn from the admixture of Daedrons into living hosts let one inhale new visions of torment, and children were set aflame for nighttime tiger sport. It would take a miracle to dismantle this tyranny, and it came from Akatosh and the Divines, who bestowed Slave Queen Alicia with the tools to liberate her people. So far, it's not looking too good for the races of Myrrh who claim so vehemently that they are innately equipped to rule Tamriel. I'm not going to pretend the humans are saints. There are examples of human misrule, like the First Empire of the Nords. In the early First Era, the Nordic Empire spread with savage efficiency. There are terrifying tales written by the Kaima that illustrate the severity of the Northmen. The Vex accounts of the demon chieftains is a good example. He writes of Hoga, the mouth of mud, breathing the earth, feasting voraciously upon the soil. He would fill his fallen ranks with sod and loam, and they would rise again to slaughter the eastern elves. There was Kamua, the running hunger, who could give clouds stomach aches and turn the reign of Velof into bile. He destroyed six Chimeri villages before he was slain by Vivek and the Hortator. And of course there's Izmir, the dragon of the north. When he spoke, villages were uplifted and thrown into the sea. Another source speaks of the Nordic expansion into Resdane. It reads, They sought only land, conquest and spoils. We extended open hands of diplomacy, which were lopped off. Any elf in the Horde's path was fair game, man, woman or child. So men are not spared from criticism. Even the cosmopolitan imperials and their many great and prosperous empires are not without faults. But in defense of the Cyrodiilic empires, they seem to be the only great powers ever to make the effort of assimilating foreign cultures into their own. When the imperials colonize new lands, they generally attempt to bring peace to the region. They station local leaders tasked with keeping interracial relations civil. They oversee the building of infrastructure and public services. Black Marsh being a good example, no superpower has ever truly been able to conquer Argonia, but whenever the Imperials make progress, they try to consolidate their control, rather than simply butchering or enslaving all the locals. When Empress Hestra sent the Imperial Navy in pursuit of the notorious pirate Red Bramon in the First Era 1033, they didn't just claim all the land along the pirate waterways as their own. They attempted to civilize the area and get rid of the brigands. But they encountered stronger and more violent resistance with each advance. So once the pirate menace was dealt with, the First Empire left Black Marsh to its native inhabitants. Nearly 2,000 years later, the Riemann dynasty spread into Argonia. The coastal areas and some parts of the interior, where it was safe to travel, received imperial leaders to rule in the Emperor's name. However, this attempt failed as well, as the human-controlled regions became little more than corrupt prison states for the Empire's greatest criminals. In the late Second Era, Tiber Septim brought Black Marsh into the Cyrodiilic Empire again. As of the late Third Era, the Empire has built roads between major coastal settlements. The Emperor's fleet guards the Topol Bay carefully, protecting merchants from the pirates who have never truly been eliminated. 
Imperial rule is maintained by local imperial governors, aided by native Argonian advisors. Evidently, the empire is not flawless, and each iteration comes with its own advantages and shortcomings. But compared to many of Tamriel's historic ruling classes, the Imperials have shown themselves to be the most civilized and cosmopolitan rulers. So why do the High Elves of Somerset seem so convinced that they should rule Tamriel? Is there any merit to Queen Aeren's claim to the Ruby Throne? And how about the Third Old Merry Dominion's rapidly growing ambitions? In the 6th century of the Second Era, when Aeren founded the First Old Merry Dominion, Tamriel was in the midst of a chaotic interregnum. The Riemann dynasty had long since fallen, and now the line of Akaviri potentates was severed by the chitinous blades of the Morag Tong. Aeren sought to fill this power vacuum, just as the Falmer of the Fourth Era wished to capitalize on the havoc caused by the Oblivion Crisis. But I don't think the Ultima would be any better at ruling the beasts and men of Tamriel than the other great elven powers mentioned so far in the video. The High Elves believe in their inherent superiority more than both the Dureni and the Aelids, and like their cousins in Morrowind and Sirid, they are not above taking slaves. The Ultima enslaved beasts like the Goblins of Somerset to perform the jobs beneath the dignity of the lowest elf, and their societal structure is heavily influenced by purity. This is the issue with elven rulers. There's no denying the cultural sophistication of the Ultima, but while the races of the mainland waged wars and forged alliances, the High Elves were isolated and homogenous. The rise and fall of empires, the battles between Man and Myrrh, none of these touched the Ultima as a society. The High Elves seem to struggle with the simple matter of whether to allow foreign races to their shores. Imperial emissaries from the Second Empire have documented their troubles in dealing with the Ultima. Ambassadors were allowed only in the capital of Alinor, and even that has been described as a rampant human trespass that chills the bones. It's hard to imagine the High Elves ruling Tamriel with any degree of benevolence or righteous forbearance. And with the Falmor leading the Third Old Mary Dominion, waging a great war against the men of Hammerfell, Cyrodiil and Skyrim, it seems that the Elves have failed to learn from history. The Elves have consistently proven themselves to be unfit rulers of any race besides their own. The Empire may be weak, and they may have failed to support their allies in recent history, but they are the only rulers ever to treat their vassals justly. Perhaps it is Stendar who should be thanked for that. To the Elves he is the apologist of men. He is weak because he does not look down upon humans. While to men, Stendar is the patron of mercy, charity, well-earned luck, and justice. He propagates compassion, righteous rule, and showing restraint when you have power over others. Stendar is a role model for good leaders, and unsurprisingly, he is a god of men, not of elves. And so, I believe the elves do not make for better rulers. They produce tremendous warriors and intellectuals, and there may be some truth to their genetic superiority, what with their generous lifespans. But belief in one's supremacy does not translate to effective leadership. Can the Old Merry Dominion change, or will it continue to scheme and manipulate until all of Tamriel kneels before it? That much remains to be seen. But there you have it guys, why elves shouldn't rule Tamriel. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching. I'm Drew, you've been watching Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.